the, um, this is Chair Mike Freiberg, pursuant to House Rule 10.01. I call this remote meeting of the Preventive Health Policy Division to order. Uh, the clerk will take the roll for attendance for quorum. Representative Freiberg. Present. Representative Bierman. Present. Representative Grunhagen. Present. Representative Akim. Present. Representative Egbaje. Present. Representative Ackland. Present. Representative Carlson. Carlson present. Representative Franzen. Present. Representative Heinzman. Present. Representative Morrison. Present. Representative Pryor. Present. Chair, you have a quorum? Uh, thank you. Um, so the next item of it on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Uh, Vice Chair Bierman, have you read the minutes of the February 17th, 2021 hearing? Yes, Mr. Chair, and I would like to make a motion for approval, please. Okay, Representative Bierman has moved approval of the minutes. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please unmute yourself and say aye. 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 Po opposed? Okay, the minutes are adopted. Uh, we have one bill on the agenda for today. It's House File 358, Representative Jordan's bill. Um, just to kind of set the stage for the bill, um, we will be following sort of a similar process to last week's uh, process that we followed on the flavored tobacco bill with one exception, we do have amendments. So uh, we wanna make sure there's time to handle those. Um, so I'm going to, after moving the bill, I will have the author present the bill um, and she has a couple presenters who are part of her presentation. There will then be public testimony. Um, people have signed up in advance and been notified uh, that they will have two minutes to speak and there will be a maximum of 20 minutes per side. Um, and also if testifiers could let us know how they would like to be uh, addressed, that would be helpful. Um, after that happens, uh, we will consider amendments. Um, hopefully there will be time for members discussion um, and then we will be voting at 11.55. Um, are there any questions from members about the process before going forward? Okay, seeing none, um, I will move uh, to re-refer House File 358 uh, to the Health Finance and Policy Committee. Um, and Representative Jordan, I understand you have an author's amendment, the A5, that would get the bill in the shape you would like it. Would you like me to move that first? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Okay, do you, do you wanna briefly say what the amendment does? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, A5 is my amendment. This is an amendment um, that was created after a consultation with the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, it's technical in nature and it gives them the ability to develop and implement these programs. And it pushes out implementation um, to give MDE the time they need to properly prepare um, both the programs and districts. Okay, thank you, Representative Jordan. Any questions regarding the author's amendment? Okay, seeing none, all those in yes, favor? I have a question, Mr. Oh, Chair. I'm sorry, I just saw that. Representative Heinzman. No, I just wanted to quickly check and see uh, if the bill or the amendment author in this case uh, could confirm that uh, it would delete language requiring that the commissioner undergo rulemaking to identify the model programs. Is that correct? That sounds a little different than just technical. Uh, Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Heinzman. Um, I see that Mr. Uni from the Department of Education is on the uh, Zoom. Perhaps he could address the question. Okay. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please uh, identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, my name is Adil Chuni. I'm the Director of Government Relations with the Department of Education. Um, so as I understand, the question is around why remove the rulemaking under the, um, under the, uh, under the proposed amendment. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Heinzman, I believe, uh, uh, Representative Heinzman, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that isn't the question. The bill, the amendment author suggested that the amendment was technical. And it sounds to me like we're deleting language requiring the commissioner to undergo rulemaking to identify the model program. That sounds more specifically like a policy issue. Is there a reason that the uh, amendment is being suggested to be a, a technical? This sounds very much like a, a policy change in the bill. Mr. Uni. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Heinzman, uh, it's technical because it's reflective of how the, uh, the department would engage in this type of activity. Um, the rulemaking association is generally, or the rulemaking process is generally associated with review and revision and adoption of standards that would be created at the state level. While this is about um, being consistent with local standards, um, when we're creating a model program for districts then to implement how they would um, how they would uh, put forward this curriculum that's in line with local standards. Since we wouldn't be adopting any rules or revise or reviewing any rules, we wouldn't need the rulemaking process to do this. Thank you. And Representative Heinzman, I mean, it's pretty standard process in committees for uh, authors to be afforded the courtesy of adopting amend amendments to put the bill in the shape they would like. Um, and Mr. I think Chair? this falls into that category regardless Mr. of whether Chair? classified as technical. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. I thought maybe you weren't able to hear me. No, I was just concerned because obviously technical uh, in the legislature uh, has a very uh, narrow definition. And I just wanted to confirm that there are changes here in the uh, A5 that uh, would fall typically under a definition of, of uh, policy. So thank you for that, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Thank you for the question, Representative Heinzman. And just also one thing I neglected to mention, I mean, this amendment does make some changes to the education portions of the bill. Um, so um, I allowed some latitude on the question there. I mean, generally speaking, if there's, uh, you know, this is a health committee, so we're going to attempt to focus on the health aspects of this bill. So seeing no additional discussion on the author's amendment, um, all those in favor, please unmute yourself and say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Please say no. Okay, the amendment no. is adopted. The bill is in the shape you would like, Representative Jordan. Uh, you may proceed with your explanation of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for the opportunity to present my bill, House File 5358 as amended, which would ensure that young people across Minnesota have the information they need to make smart decisions about their health, their bodies, and their relationships. Every person makes important decisions about their sexual and reproductive health throughout their lifetime. However, Minnesota has no statewide standard for whether essential information about reproductive health, consent, or healthy relationships is provided in our schools. This means that students across different school districts receive completely different information about sexual and reproductive health, while others get no information at all. Comprehensive sex education supports healthy youth development by helping young people make smart decisions about their health and relationships. These programs also promote open communication between young people and the trusted adults in their life. Comprehensive sex education programs are age and developmentally appropriate, medically accurate, inclusive, and culturally sensitive. Importantly, these programs also teach consent, including respecting other people's boundaries and how to say no to unwanted sexual activity. Prevention begins with educating young people about these issues, how to identify them, and how to handle them when they arise. And since this is the Preventive Health Committee, Health Policy Committee, I wanna take a minute to emphasize the positive health effects of comprehensive sexual health programs. Research overwhelmingly shows that students who participate in comprehensive sex um, health programs are more likely to delay sexual intercourse, have fewer sexual partners, have fewer instances of unprotected sex, increase their use of protection, specifically condoms and other contraceptives, have lower rates of STIs and HIV among students, and have lower rates of unintended pregnancies. Rates of sexually transmitted infections are at record highs among young people in Minnesota, as you can see in the report from the University of Minnesota included in your packet. Clearly, our young people are not getting the information they need to make smart decisions about their health. Comprehensive sexual health education is supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Public Health Association, primarily because of the positive health effects it has for young people. Here in Minnesota, the bill is supported by the Minnesota Medical Association, who says in their letter of support, also in your packet, that the MMA supports sexual health education as a means towards a healthier Minnesota. Lastly, in addition to the overwhelming research that shows that comprehensive sexual health programs are good for the health of young people, young people are asking for this information. You'll hear directly from young Minnesotans today why they want this information and how important it is to them. You'll also see a number of letters of support from students across the state of Minnesota supporting this bill and asking you to make sure they get this information. I ask that you take time to read these words and respect the students and testifiers here today. 
With that, Mr. Chair, I am happy to walk through the bill itself as amended. So section one um, defines the model programs. It directs uh, the Minnesota Department of Education in consultation with MDH and other experts to identify one or more model comprehensive sex health education programs for elementary and secondary students. Uh, section sub paragraph, sub paragraph one, paragraph B requires that the model programs identified by MDE must be medically accurate, age and developmentally appropriate, culturally inclusive and grounded in science. It also lists the topics that must be included in the model program or programs include human anatomy, reproduction and sexual development, consent, bodily autonomy and healthy relationships, including relationships involving diverse sexual orientations and gender identities, abstinence and other methods for preventing unintended pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections, and the relationship between substance abuse and sexual behavior and health. Um, then we define consent. We require that the model program or programs include information about inappropriate sexual contact between students and school employees. Uh, we direct districts to use existing curriculum review standards to ensure transparency and the opportunity for individual parental review. We also direct school districts to implement a comprehensive sex health education program uh, starting in the 24-25 school year. Um, in addition to the topics, this program must also respect community values, encourage communication with parents and guardians, faith leaders, or other trusted adults, be culturally diverse, inclusive, and respectful, and provide students with information about local resources for medically accurate information and services related to sexual and reproductive health, dating, violence, and sexual assault. Um, we also allow school districts or other charter schools to adopt their own model program um, upon approval from MDE. We also require that a district, and we require districts that adopt a model program identified by MDE to report which, select, which program is selected. So if MDE identifies more than one program, uh, this directs districts to specify which program. Um, we also allow someone other than a licensed teacher to provide comprehensive sex health education instruction. This could include a non-licensed person already employed by the district or a community organization if the administration determines the non-licensed employee or community organization has necessary content expertise. We also require that districts provide instructions in accordance with parental curriculum review requirements um, which allow parents to opt out of instruction. We also have a sex health education report, which requires MDE to submit a report to the education committees on the CSC program by January 15th of 2024. Um, this pro report must include a description of how the model um, sexual health education programs were identified, implementation assistance, number of school districts and charter schools that adopted each model, and a list of district and charter schools that sought approval from MDE for their own alternative model program and including districts that did not, see, not, did not receive approval. And with that, Mr. Chair, I am happy to turn over um, my presentation to some of my testifiers. Uh, thank you, Representative Jordan. Um, and if your testifiers could uh, keep themselves to about two minutes each, that would be helpful um, and enable us to have time for amendments and discussion. So. Uh, could the first testifier please identify themselves and proceed with their testimony? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe I will be going first. Um, so thank you and thank you committee members. Um, I'm Adriana Perez, uh, the Prevention Program Coordinator at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, MNCASA. Prior to my role at Mincasa, I was an advocate for victims and survivors of sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, and family violence. Mincasa is a statewide coalition of over 75 member programs, allies, and survivors, and we are here today to support House File 358 and to thank Representative Jordan, co-authors, and this committee for advancing this conversation. The Center for Disease Control identifies teaching skills such as consent, healthy relationships, healthy sexuality, and empowerment as a best practice for sexual violence prevention. Mincasa supports this as an effective strategy of prevention, which is why this bill is so important. Until things change, one in four girls and one in six boys nationally will be sexually assaulted or abused by the age of 18. Parent, guardians, schools, and communities share a responsibility to use proven strategies to protect all children from sexual violence so young people can build positive, healthy relationships throughout their lives. We have also learned from the 2019 Minnesota Student Survey that a little over one in five LGBT plus students in grades nine and 11 have been sexually assaulted or abused compared to about one in 10 non-LGBT plus students in Minnesota. 
This means that LGBT plus students experience sexual assault at twice the rate of their non-LGBT plus counterparts. These few statistics start to paint a clear picture of what youth are currently experiencing and why prevention education, such as comprehensive sexual health education is so needed. Topics such as healthy relationships, communication skills, consent, and setting and respecting boundaries are all part of comprehensive sex education. These topics help youth develop practical skills so that they can make the best and safest choices for themselves. This empowers youth to create healthy relationships that uphold their values and boundaries and teach them how to respect others' boundaries as well. It is also important to note that these skills go beyond dating relationships. The more we develop skills, the healthier all of our relationships will be throughout life, including our friends, family, relationships, and even our colleagues. Providing comprehensive sex education within schools is the most effective and efficient way to reach Minnesota's youth and reduce perpetration of sexual violence. Statewide healthy relationship and sex education allows youth to receive consent messaging um, and consistent messaging around the knowledge of healthy relationship skills. Comprehensive sex education will provide youth with the necessary tools for safe, healthy, consenting relationships of all kinds. Thank you for your time, committee. I yield my time. Thank you for your testimony. I think uh, next as part of the authors, testifiers is Hadija Steen Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you for allowing me to testify in favor of HF 358. My name is Hadija Steen Mills and I'm a parent born and raised in the Twin Cities. I'm also a proud graduate of the University of Minnesota with a degree in human sexuality focused on reproductive justice and disparities. In the last four years as a sexual health educator, I have taught over 600 hours of comprehensive sexuality education to over 1,000 students in both the Twin Cities and the rural South. While supporting our young people, I have seen firsthand the impact of kindness and compassion. I have also seen that not everyone's experience is the same. According to the 2020 Minnesota Adolescent Sexual Health Report, the rates of chlamydia and gonorrhea are highest among Black and Hispanic youth. The gonorrhea rate is 28 times higher and the chlamydia rate is nine times higher among Black youth compared to white youth. The birth rate for American Indian, Hispanic, and Black youth is seven, four, and three times higher compared to white adolescents. The state and the nation have a duty to support our youth to rectify and prevent these unjust disparities. The events of 2020 opened many people's eyes to deep and rooted inequities that are an undercurrent in this country and the world. In the context of Minnesota, the issue is magnified due to the Minnesota paradox. The Minnesota paradox is the phenomenon that Minnesota ranks as one of the best places to live in the nation, but only if you're white. If you're black, Native American, or a person of color, it ranks as one of the worst. With the declaration of racism as a public health crisis, we have an opportunity as a state with such different lived experiences and health outcomes, we can live up to our motto, La Toile du Nord, and be the star of the North for disparity mitigation and preventative health. Sexuality encompasses many components, such as gender identity, reproduction, consent, abstinence, healthy relationships, and sexual orientation. These aspects create a through line in the human experience that also compound and interact with other pieces of a person's identities and backgrounds. Disparities don't exist in a silo, and we need to uplift every area impacted by inequity. Comprehensive sexuality education is another means to disparity mitigation by creating a world where family input is valued, facts are fundamental, and identities are uplifted. HF 358 is one move towards Minnesota being a leader, a lodestar, guiding the ship towards a more just future. I strongly support you to vote in favor of HF 358. Thank you all for your time and for your dedication to equity. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next presenter for the author is Ava Kalenzi. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Freeberg and members of the committee. My name is Ava Kalenz. I am currently a senior at St. Anthony Village High School, a small public high school located just outside of Northeast Minneapolis. I currently serve as the chair of the Minnesota Youth Council, a legislatively mandated organization of young people from all across Minnesota who advise the state agencies and legislature on issues that impact young people. I serve on the Health and Wellbeing Committee on the MYC and also have the opportunity to hold positions of leadership locally and at different levels within the state in areas of student experience and health. I'm here to testify in support of House File 358 because as a representative of student values, I recognize that knowledge is power when it comes to managing an individual's health. 
I understand why people are initially averted to the subject of comprehensive sex education. They view the content as mature and private, identifying it as abhorrent, while the general nature of the subject is rooted in values upheld in other areas of society, things like honor, respect, and knowledge. The lack of comprehensive sex education and its many intersections does not stop students from engaging in or being exposed to such behaviors. Students today, unlike other past generations, have the entity of the internet in their lives. The internet makes students privy to a whole world of exploitation and unhealthy communication that has never existed before, in addition to the other things that exist on the internet, which further demonstrate the need for instruction surrounding how to navigate this important aspect of life. The lack of proper education simply leaves young people and later adults without the knowledge of their option, autonomy or options. The system perpetuates violence, ignorance, and inadequate health. If it is the school system's responsibility to educate the youth of society about general subjects, vocational aptitude, social mores, and understanding one's place in the world, it is also the school system's responsibility to teach young people about how to manage their physical bodies in order to holistically round out students as members of society. As a young person about to enter the real world, I realize the importance of empowering young people with knowledge in every aspect of their education. In addition to all of the academic skills that young people are expected to have by the time they complete their education, why would we not also expect young people to have skills to navigate a very serious and coercive area of their lives and skills to navigate a healthcare system that consistently lets down women, non-binary folks, those that don't identify with a heteronormative sexual orientation and people of color, not to mention anyone who exists at the intersections of one of those identities. Giving students access to this education that isn't shameful, marginalizing, graphic, or inappropriate for their circumstances gives them the power of knowledge. Knowledge is empowering, knowledge will keep us safe, and knowledge will keep us healthy. If there is anything that has become pertinent over the past year, it is how interconnected every facet of our lives are and how it is all affected by public health. Comprehensive sexual health and consent education is statistically and scientifically backed by evidence that shows reductions in transmission of STIs, adolescent pregnancy, sexual harassment and violence, and an overall healthier, well-adjusted society. I am here in support of House File 358 because I have experienced the dynamics of an education that is not appropriate to the ever-changing society that it exists in. As our conversations turn to be more inclusive and supportive, we must equip our young people with an education that suits their needs and allows them a level of autonomy to enter their adult lives with confidence and respect for others. You please, have the power... Oh. Please wrap up your... You can have a closing sentences, but if you could wrap it up, that would be helpful. Okay. I hope that you will choose to empower students in their health. Thank you for hearing the voices of young people that, on issues that impact them, and I thank you for your time. I yield my time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, so I will turn now to uh, public testimony. I'll take testimony from those speaking in opposition to the bill uh, first and then turn to those speaking in support of the bill. Um, just so uh, I think you were meant, this was mentioned in an email that went out to testifiers, but uh, we will be timing it. There, the, uh, uh, the staff person will be uh, letting you know when, there's, when you have 30 seconds remaining um, and then they will let you know when the two minutes is, is up. And if you keep going at that point, I may jump in like I just did. Um, so I will uh, let people know who's speaking next and then who will be speaking after them so, the pe so those people can get ready. Um, so first on the list of the people speaking in opposition to the bill will be Larry Sachi. And then um, after Larry will be Rebecca, and I do not have a last name for Rebecca. Um, so hopefully you know who that is. So welcome to the committee, uh, Larry Sachi. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, hi, this is Larry Sachi. Thank you so much for uh, letting me speak. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share this with you today. I want to let you. I want to let you understand why I'm against the comprehensive sex education curriculum. We as parents and grandparents know that children absorb knowledge very quickly, but in many cases, they do not know how to process it. They do not know what is good for them in the long run or will hurt them. Because of this, we teach in a way that gives them a little information first, then um, put in context of good and bad or healthy or not healthy, let them process for a while, and then add the next thing. We do this with things like movies and TV. Uh, we have <clears throat> Excuse me. We um, sorry. 
we have brains that help us with this. Um, we do not let them watch violent movies until we feel they can process it appropriately. We even uh, use this approach in teaching outdoor skills. We teach them things they can handle at different grade levels, building, building up to um, uh, full skills as they grow up. Even mathematics is taught that way. You don't teach a fourth greater calculus. You build up to a theoretic geometry, et cetera, over the years. Along the way, we teach what we teach is youthful and how it fits into everyday life and supports our interactions in a positive way. This is now a comprehensive sex education is doing. It's throwing all the information at once and guiding students to build by little form healthy bonds with people before engaging in sex chats. It's not allowing the parents to help guide their children in the morals they hold so dear. This will only confuse a child and foster an experiment that does not respect the other. Just consenting or not consenting is not respect. Also, why? Also, That's why? Right. Is, um, put this curriculum is so untested in literature. Uh, so um, just uh, we think I thank you so much for uh, allowing me the time to express my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Saki. Next on the list is Rebecca. I just saw Rebecca Morris um, turn her camera on. So I'm guessing that's you. And then after Rebecca Morris will be Julie Quist. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, Ms. Morris, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Morris, and I am here today to testify um, in strong opposition of Bill HF 358. Um, like I said, my name is Rebecca, and I have my bachelor's degree in kinesiology and a master's in human services with a specialization in health and wellness. More importantly, though, I am also a mother to four amazing children. When I first was made aware of this bill, I decided to research and look into exactly what the curriculum would be because on the surface, it seems like it would be good. But when I looked at what the books would be used, what I read and saw, I was horrified and shocked that anyone in my state legislature would be promoting this and wanting this comprehensive sex health education in my children's schools. So I began to discuss this with the moms in my community and they were completely unaware of what would be in the curriculum. And they were angered that our kids could be subjected to this incredibly graphic and pornographic material. Most parents have no idea what CSE curriculum would be teaching and I can confidently say if they knew they would stand in solidarity with each other and say no. In the material, there are numerous pictures of grown naked men and women pictures of couples having sex, teaching children how to masturbate and teaching children gender theories that have yet to stand the test of time. Not only is this inappropriate in a school setting, but I'm not willing to let my children be a psychological experiment. Exploration of diverse gender identities can cause confusion for children and create unnecessary mental health issues. I, this would create more harm than good. And if parents want to have these discussions with their children, it is more appropriate for them to do so than done at school. Also, this curriculum is deeply disrespectful for the Muslim and Jewish and Christian communities. I fear that this is a graphic exposure for our children. And since sex trafficking is on the rise, this would be grooming them and they would target vulnerable children, exploit them in multiple ways. The curriculum is unsafe and harmful. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, I have Julie Quist, and after Julie Quist will be Barbara DeVries. Uh, welcome to the committee. Ms. Quist, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Julie Quist, representing Child Protection League Action. Since we are addressing preventive health in this committee, I would like to point out something that has become obvious in the last few years. The field of medicine and health has become politicized. Claims of being scientifically and medically accurate are increasingly agenda-driven. Once Americans relied on science to provide genuine information, today so-called experts are often one-sided, rarely neutral, and usually omit important data. Words like medically accurate obscure a multitude of fallacies. For example, is consent really sexual abuse prevention? Teaching minors how to negotiate sexual encounters or how to ask for or get consent from other children encourages them to consent to sex. Sexual activity and exploration between children is neither safe nor healthy. 
Comprehensive sex education also normalizes high-risk sexual behaviors. For example, it normalizes anal and oral sex, but frequently it omits the medical fact that such practices are closely linked to high rates of sexually transmitted infections, injuries, and cancers. The default value underlying CSE ideology is that all sexual activity is safe and healthy as long as it is protected and consensual. In fact, CSE teaches young people that being sexually active is itself healthy. As has claimed, studies show the CSE is effective. Competing studies show it is not, including five endorsed by the CDC Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program. I included my references. Other studies show sexually active girls are three times more likely to be depressed and to attempt suicide and teen boys twice as likely to be depressed and a shocking eight times more likely to attempt suicide. Those references are also included in my handout. Please vote no on HF358. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next speaker is Barbara, Dreve Barbara DeVries, excuse me. Um, and that is all the people we've had sign up to speak in opposition to the bill. So uh, following Ms. DeVries will be Jennifer Oliphant speaking in support of the legislation. So. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Vries. Uh, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Barbara DeVries. I am from Minnesota District 18A. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in opposition to HF 358, the mandated comprehensive sexual health education program for Minnesota K-12 schools. I am a wife and a mother of five children, and I believe it is important to educate children about human development and healthy sexual relationships. Right now, parents already have to be very vigilant about what their children are exposed to in our society, on the internet, on television. Parents should be able to count on the teachers of their children to aid them in the job of protecting their children from being exposed to sexual activity before the children are developmentally ready to learn about such a subject. The curriculum being presented today to be adopted as comprehensive sexual health education is anything but healthy. It is designed to groom children for a life of over-sexualized behaviors and abuse. The pornographic illustrations included in these materials is offensive to most adults. Surely children should not be subjected to such graphic images. This curriculum is not only harmful to the children, but also to the teachers who would be forced to use these materials to spread lies to their impressionable students. HF 358 would compel teachers to say, boys may choose to be girls and girls may choose to be boys. The transgender ideology is a dangerous path toward mental health disorders, abuse of hormone therapy drugs, and even bodily mutilation through surgery on genitalia. This is not healthy. Rather, teachers should teach the children to respect the body they are born with and to give their body proper care. seconds remaining. Parents take care to warn their children about predators. They teach the children just where to punch or kick a kidnapper, where to go for help, what to do and say when someone tries to keep a secret from their parents. God forbid that the teacher the parents trust to educate their child would become one of these predators. I oppose this bill and urge you to vote no on House File 358. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next, uh, we will now turn to uh, testimony in support of the legislation. First on the list is Dr. Jennifer Oliphant, and after Dr. Oliphant will be Jillian Nelson. Uh, welcome to the committee, Dr. Oliphant. Please proceed with your testimony after identifying yourself. Thank you, Chair Freiberg and members of the committee. I am Jennifer Oliphant. I work for pediatrics at the University of Minnesota in the uh, Prevention Research Center. At the Prevention Research Center, much of my work in the past 30 years has focused on the effective approaches for teen pregnancy prevention, STD prevention, and ways of promoting resiliency and healthy development in our young people. First, I believe it's important to answer this question, the question that I'm often asked when I speak with parents and legislature and the media, how does medically accurate sex education affect our kids when schools use rigorously tested and evaluated curricula? What happens? This is what we know from scientific research in Minnesota, the United States and around the world. The impact of this kind of sex education includes delays in first uh, it delays in age of first intercourse, increased proper use of condoms and contraception among sexually active adolescents, fewer sexual partners over time, lower rates of teen pregnancy, abortion, and birth. Uh, 
Additionally, I'd like to venture that it's highly likely that the landscape of healthcare will be changing and our young people will need to know how to do home testing, including home STD testing. Health education in our schools that is comprehensive gives young people the health literacy skills that they need in order to follow the future of health. Based on current scientific evidence, I'd also like to mention that other forms of sex education that only discuss abstinence and that include medically inaccurate information do not allow healthy youth to, do not allow healthy changes in behavior. According to a major report from the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, find, the findings indicate that youth in abstinence only program group were no more likely than the control group to have abstained from sex. And among those who have reported having had sex, they had similar numbers of sexual partners and had uh, initiated sex at the same mean age. That's time. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Elephant. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, next on the list is Jillian Nelson and following Jillian Nelson will be Avon Lee Carey. Good morning, Chairman Freiberg and committee members. My name is Jillian Nelson, and I am the Community Resource and Policy Advocate for the Autism Society of Minnesota. I'm a member of the Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities, the State Rehabilitation Council, and the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities. I'm here today to ask for your support for House File 358. In my role at Awesome, I receive countless calls from parents and adults desperate for a resource to find a class for sexual education. Sometimes it's because the parents are worried about vulnerability or that their teen has the information to make healthy relationship choices. Sometimes it's because adults are learning that they didn't get the information on how their bodies work or what boundaries look like, and they just ended another abusive relationship. These calls hit far too close to home for comfort. You see, I'm an autistic adult too, a person with a disability. And as a special education student, I did not receive sexual education in school. I did not learn about consent or healthy relationships or my body or how to keep myself safe and healthy. I have learned those things since through mistakes that cost me dearly in trauma and dignity. I should have learned them in a classroom. Sexuality is a natural and healthy part of being human. All humans have a right to their sexuality and to express this in a safe and comfortable way. In my community, autistic children and adults experience disproportionately high rates of victimization, including sexual assault in comparison to non-autistic peers. A lack of sexuality education has been shown to be one factor related to increased risk of victimization. 30 seconds remaining. Here in the United States, students with disabilities are promised a free and appropriate public education. I would argue that restricting access to comprehensive and appropriate sexual education that would prevent victimization and sexual assault and encourage consent and healthy choices is depriving us of the education appropriate to our long-term well-being. Sex education is not a pep rally to encourage sexuality. It is, in fact, a necessary conversation to make healthy, mindful choices. It is a tool to teach us our rights and responsibilities when it comes to our bodies. And it's a chance to give students the necessary information to avoid poor choices that lead to victimization and trauma. It's an undeniable step to ending the legacy of sexual trauma, not just for students with disabilities, but for all future generations. I thank you for your time and support. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list is Avon Lee Carey, and after Avon Lee Carey will be Tori Westenberg. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for uh, the, the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, committee. Thank you for hearing me today. My name is Avon Lee Carey. I'm 22 years old from East Grand Forks, Minnesota, House District 7, and I am here in support of House File 358. I support increased access to comprehensive sex education for Minnesota students because the sex education I received was abstinence only and lacked medical and scientific accuracy. Now as a 22 year old woman, I am greatly affected by this inadequate teaching in my personal life, even as an adult. I am racked with the guilt and shame abstinence only sexual education imposes on children. I am engaged and have been in the same committed relationship for going on six years and it is a fight with myself to be okay with participating in consensual sex without feeling wrong for doing so. Not only am I a young person who has directly been influenced by the lack of comprehensive sex ed in our state, but I am also a parent who wants more for my child. I have a three-year-old daughter who I am here to advocate for. She, like so many other future generations, is entitled to comprehensive sex ed that many in my generation were not fortunate enough to have. Nor did I, like many young people, have parents that would educate me about my sexual health. That is why it is so important for our schools to teach youth of all ages 
comprehensive sex education. It is vital that the sex education that our children receive is LGBTQ inclusive, as well as age appropriate, shame free and culturally responsive. Our children need to learn about consent in healthy relationships. Our children need to know the medically accurate names for their genitals. Our children need to see themselves, their cultures, their genders, and their sexual identities represented in all of their education. The policy outlined in HF 358 directly impacts the lives of young people in Minnesota, like my daughter, and ensures all of this. I ask the members of the Preventative Policy Committee to consider the experiences and overwhelming support of parents like myself across the state of Minnesota. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list is Tori Westenberg, and after Tori Westenberg will be Dan Buck. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Tori Westenberg. I'm 17 years old, and my pronouns are she and they. I'm a member of both Outfront Minnesota and Minnesota Youth Activist Alliance. Most importantly, however, I am a dedicated youth activist committed to implementing equity and safety in schools. As a young LGBTQ person and a high school student, I am here today in support of House File 358, a sexual education bill that will ensure an all-inclusive comprehensive sex education curriculum throughout the state. The current sex ed framework is harmful to the development of young LGBTQ people such as myself because it does not require the education of LGBTQ experiences. And when we know that our policies are not intentionally inclusive, those who face the highest forms of marginalization are oftentimes left out. Throughout my own experience in high school, I was deprived of a medically and scientifically accurate sexual education that offered information relevant to my experiences as, as, as an LGBTQ youth person. This lack of education caused me to have to learn about consent, preventing sexual assault, and what to do in a healthy LGBTQ relationship all on my own without any help from our school, six, from our school curriculum, which only made me more vulnerable to misinformation. This lack of inclusivity across the board in our sexual education causes confusion among young people and puts us at higher risk for intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and leaves LGBTQ youth like myself disproportionately at risk of contracting STIs. Students of the LGBTQ community deserve, deserve to know what happy and healthy relationships look like for them because they matter, yet that they have been deprived of seeing their health needs represented in our current policies. When we support any education that reinforces sexual shame by excluding LGBTQ youth, we are participating in violence against young people. With Bill House File 358, I believe all students will benefit from age-appropriate, culturally relevant sexual education because it is crucial to the protection of young people everywhere. I'm here today because young people's sexual education and health is important regardless of happen who you happen to be or love. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list is Dan Buck, and following Dan Buck, uh, our final testifier who signed up was, is Xander Selly. So welcome to the committee. Uh, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Dan Buck, are you there? I can't hear you. You might be muted. Sorry, I was muted. Okay, gotcha. I think I'd have it by this time. Okay, but please proceed. Thank you. We hear you now. Thank you, Chair Freiberg and committee members. Hello, my name is Dan Buck, and I work in the Education Equity Department of Outfront, Minnesota. I'm here to advocate for sex education in Minnesota school systems and for it to include our LGBTQ students. Formal sex education varies in content across schools, and studies have demonstrated that comprehensive sexuality education programs reduce the rates of sexual activity, sexual risk behaviors such as number of partners, and unprotected intercourse, STIs, and adolescent pregnancy. The same study compared risk activity in students who received sex education versus students who received absence only, and it showed no increase in risk activities in students receiving comp sex education. LGBTQ youth are negatively impacted as a result of many factors. For LGBTQ youth, social stigma around their sexual choices or identities can be particularly difficult. Stigma comes in many forms, such as discrimination, harassment, family disapproval, social rejection, and violence. This puts LGBTQ youth at increased risk for certain negative health outcomes. For example, disproportionately higher rates of sexually transmitted diseases. Lesbian and bisexual females are more likely, than, uh, more likely to have ever been pregnant than their heterosexual peers. And transgender youth are more likely to have attempted suicide than their cisgender peers. As a bisexual kid, I was left out of the conversation because adults were uncomfortable. This uncomfortable feeling by people who should have been watching out for us put me at risk. 
By leaving a population out of the conversation, you leave them uninformed and at risk because they don't have access to information that can protect them. It creates stigma around their sexual health and leaves them afraid to ask questions. You cannot stop kids from having sex. What you need to do is give them information that allows safer decision-making and should not be put in terms of who is having sex, male, female, transgender, but that it is happening and there are ways to be safer about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Our final testifier is Xander Danielson Selly. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Xander Daniel Sincelli. My pronouns are they, them, and I live in St. Paul. Uh, House File 358 is important to me because I didn't, growing up, I didn't get the education I could have gotten. Um, for example, there, was, there wasn't more than a one or two minute conversation about anything other than heterosexual relationships. Uh, I also wasn't given really any information about consent, very minimal at best. Um, it's not like everybody keeps saying that this bill will promote people, will promote students being sexual. Students are still going to, kids are still going to find the information. They can either learn it from a professional and in school, or they will find it on the internet somewhere else by experimenting themselves. And that's when people can get hurt. For, I know for my, several of my LGBTQ friends, this would have made a big difference in their youth and would have actually saved them from having 30 seconds remaining unfortunate medical complications. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, that concludes our public testimony on the bill. Um, so I'd like to turn now to amendments just to make sure we have time. And I also consulted uh, with Representative Grunhagen, the Republican lead on this committee, just about his preferred amendment order, uh, just to make sure we got to the ones he wanted. Um, so uh, Representative Grunhagen, I think you had listed the A3 amendment first. Did you want to move that? Yes, Mr. Chair, I, correct. I move the A3 amendment. Okay. Uh, the A3 amendment has been moved. Please explain your amendment, Representative Grunhagen. What this amendment does, it incorporates uh, what's in state statute 121A.23. This is already in state statute, and it gives uh, direct guidance to health education at our local school district. Uh, I'll quote part of what's in 121A.23. Uh, it says to have technically accurate and updated curriculum that includes helping students to abstain from sexual activity until marriage. Uh, this current bill would supersede that law by affirming a student's choice to be se sexually active, implicitly giving them permission and approval. So um, members, I think we should include what's already in state statute when we're giving uh, guidance uh, as far as this sex ed is concerned. So. Uh, I'll stand for questions and Mr. Chair, I'd like a roll call. Okay, a roll call has been requested, so there will be a roll call. Uh, Representative Jordan, did you have any comments or, uh, or do your testifiers have any comments on this amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a few thoughts on this and Representative Grunhagen, thank you for your amendment. I'm glad that we recognize that giving students information about STI prevention is critically important. Um, however, um, I really think that what our students are asking for and the students who have testified today and the students who have submitted written testimony, testimony and the students I've spoken to are really asking for more information about relationships. They're asking for information about gender identity and consent. And this, I think, would get in the way of that. So I, at this time, cannot accept this amendment. And I would ask the committee for a no vote. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Grunhagen. Well, thank you. Thank you for that response, Representative Jordan. But I just want to make clear to committee meetings or committee members 
She's rejecting what's already in state statute, which shows what the intent of this bill is. It's to override what's in state statute. And that is completely unacceptable, I think, to parents and uh, the teachers and uh, health professionals. By the way, I've received, I've been in the legislature 11 years now, and I've received hundreds of emails in opposition to this more than on any other issue I've ever dealt with, whether it's guns or uh, health care or whatever. And I've received emails from parents, educators, teachers, uh, and health professionals. Uh, one of them is my constituent. I do want to share this with the, uh, uh, it's a teacher. And here's what she says. I won't read it all, but she's reviewed comprehensive sex ed. And I have to agree with Julie and Re Rebecca and those who, uh, who, who testified in opposition to it. And here's a teacher that emailed me. Uh, she said, students should not be encouraged to explore sexual pleasure. The current requirement that districts have a curriculum that helps a student abstain from sexual activity until marriage or adulthood is healthier. So members, I don't see why we would vote not to put current statute into this bill. So I encourage a yes vote and thank you, Mr. Chairman for roll call. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Any further discussion to the A3 amendment? Okay, seeing none, a roll call has been requested. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. The chair votes no. I apologize, one second. Representative Freiberg. No. Representative Bierman. No. Representative Grunhagen. Yes. Representative Akam. No. Representative Igbaje. No. Uh, Representative Igbaje, can you vote? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, uh, Igbaje votes no. Thank you. Representative Ackland. Ackland, aye. Representative Carlson. Carlson, no. Representative Franson. Franson, yes. Representative Heinzman. Aye. Representative Morrison. Representative Pryor. No. With four ayes and six nays, uh, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Uh, Representative Grunhagen, did you want to move the A2 amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd move the A2, and uh, I would have a few comments when you're ready. Yep, uh, Representative Grunhagen has moved the A2. Uh, please describe your amendment, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, I, as most of you know, I spent six, or 13 or 16 years on the school board, 13 years in jail ministry, <laughs> not in jail, but jail ministry. And uh, during that period of time, for almost a decade, I tried to pass at the school board level that we should separate male and female students in terms of sex ed. Uh, I always failed, it seemed, by one vote, even though I tried numerously. My, this amendment is based on research on uh, the, the fact that uh, teaching sex ed to young impressionable uh, teenagers going through puberty who haven't had their, their uh, minds fully developed in terms of weighing the consequences of their actions can be extremely damaging and destroy their uh, God-given uh, characteristic of modesty. Now, it's the same God-given characteristic that is that uh, or the same God that gave us the unalienable rights in the Declaration of Independence. So you destroy the student's modesty. Once you do that, it, it's much easier to promote promiscuity uh, among the students, especially young people. Uh, and we've heard about the uh, consequences of that in terms of uh, mental, physical, and other words. But I'd like to share with you also a CDC request for information, Center for Disease Control. A few years ago, they estimated that the number of STDs in our country was 110 million. You can locate that on the internet. Well, that means about one out of every three people in this country is walking around with an STD, right? 
In the 60s, there were about five STDs. Most of them were curable. Today, there's between 20 and 30 STDs, and many of them are uncurable. So members, the least we can do for our students if we're going to share this explicit information, not based on state statute, is to separate them. We already have an unfunded mandate in the curriculum, so I urge members to support this amendment and protect the children, uh, the children's modesty and their health. If you care about the children, even a little bit, you're gonna support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Roll call, by the way. Okay, a roll call has been requested on the A2 amendment, so there will be a roll call. Uh, Representative Jordan, do you have any comments on this amendment? I do, Mr. Chair, um, and you know, I think this is an interesting amendment. We, I'm not sure how segregating students by their gender impacts their value statements, but uh, it seems that we're a little misinformed on what the effects of comprehensive sex education actually do. So I, we've seen plenty of research and perhaps uh, Dr. Oliphant could testify to that, that actually if we're concerned about STI transmission, comprehensive sex education reduces rates of STI infection. It also reduces unintended pregnancy and it delays um, first sexual encounter by um, more than abstinence only does. So I don't know if um, Dr. Oliphant can talk about her research um, and her experience as a doctor on this. Uh, Dr. Oliphant, any comments? Well, I, I concur with uh, Representative Jordan that the, the overwhelming amount of research uh, does support that uh, comprehensive sex education gives young people the needed tools to make healthy decisions around uh, STDs. As far as uh, separating uh, males and females, bodied persons, um, I, I don't know that there's any research to support that one way or another. Um, but I would like to say that in, in the in the reality of health and health care, we end up having to take care of each other regardless of our gender or sexual orientation or uh, or sex. So um, separating young people so that they don't know what happened in the other classroom only probably brings mystery rather than uh, health information that they need to be more health literate. Thank you. Uh, Representative, okay. Uh, Representative Grunhagen, any? Yeah, comments? thank you. Chair. Yeah, I would just say that uh, I also have some research or, or an email here from a constituent who uh, is a health professional who shared research, okay? Uh, their research comes out quite a bit different. They said comprehensive sex ed does not delay sexual activity, does not reduce teen pregnancy, does not reduce the number of sexual partners, and does not re result in lower STD transmissions. Again, uh, that's from a health professional who quotes studies in their email. The other thing I'd like to say is based on the uh, opposition testimony, I do believe science and research and the studies have been politicized. We see this throughout government in so many cases where uh, studies simply are given money to come up with a conclusion that's already predetermined before the study's done. Uh, we see that the uh, uh, the journal or the the scientific uh, journals also have to condemn some of these studies as inaccurate when they initially come out uh, later on when they're not properly peer peer reviewed. So there's a huge incentive for financial reasons in many cases to promote. Uh, science, so-called science and research and studies that fit a political agenda. I think that's more prevalent today than ever before. And members, please care about the children and vote to support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Is there any additional discussion regarding the A2 amendment? Okay, seeing none, a roll call has been requested. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Representative Freiberg. No. Representative Bierman. No. Representative Grunhagen. Yes. Representative Akam. No. Representative Igbaje. No. Representative Ackland. Yes. Representative Carlson. No. Representative Franzen. Franzen, yes. Representative Heinzman. Yes. Representative Morrison. 
Representative Pryor. No. With four ayes and six nays, the motion does not prevail. Thank you, Ms. Somick. Uh, so, Representative Grunhagen, would you like to move the A6 amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, what the A6 amendment does, it says that if the people who support this are so confident that it's going to reduce unintended pregnancies, sexually transmitted disease, and mental distress, that they should be willing to, to have what they're being taught have liability consequences. In other words, if children or students practice what you're teaching them and it doesn't work out that way, they should be able to sue the school district and, and the people who are teaching this stuff to them. And I think that uh, if they're so confident, you know, Representative Jordan and your supporters are so confident, you should embrace this uh, uh, amendment and, because it should give accountability and uh, uh, protection for the children if what you're saying happens to be false and wrong. So, Mr. Chair, I urge that we uh, uh, adopt this amendment, and I would call for a roll call. Uh, thank you. Representative Grunhagen has moved the A6 amendment and is requesting a roll call, so there will be a roll call. Uh, Representative Jordan, do you have any thoughts on this amendment? Uh, I do have thoughts on this amendment, Mr. Chair. It's certainly an interesting amendment. I think we could go right back to that research that Dr. Oliphant just surmised. The other point that's important to remember is that parents can opt their children out of this programming just like they can opt their, out of any other programming in schools. I also would be pretty curious to hear what uh, you know local districts and taxpayers would think about this amendment. Um, I don't think it's an appropriate amendment, and I don't think it sets a good precedent for schools. Um, you know, I still have a little bit of emotional damage from worrying about imaginary numbers in uh, my high school math class, so I don't think this is an appropriate amendment to add to this bill, and I ask for a no vote. Uh, thank you, Representative Jordan. Um, any additional member discussion to the A6 amendment? I'd have a final. Amendment? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would just uh, uh, or, uh, say that this amendment will actually prove what you're saying today, okay, for those of you who support this bill. So I don't, or if you really think what you're saying works, you should support this. Second thing is inside the bill, uh, non-licensed teachers can be brought in to teach this comprehensive sex ed. And in the education committee, it was questioned as to why that was allowed in the bill. And the response was because some uh, licensed teachers sh uh, might be uncomfortable teaching the comprehensive sex ed to their students. Think about that members. That's what we're doing to the children. Again, we should be having licensed teachers. And yet in this bill, we have a provision to exclude licensed teachers and to bring in outside uh, individuals to teach this to the children. And finally, members, we know from last year, this bill was advanced also. It was admitted by the previous author. It's supported by Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood was founded by Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was a racist and a white supremacist. It, uh, Planned Parenthood continues on that uh, path today. There's about 16% of our population are black, and yet 40% of abortions in this country are black children members. A vote for this bill that's endorsed by Planned Parenthood, uh, you're supporting the racist organization. Please vote uh to support this amendment so we can have consequences for uh, what is being taught. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Uh, any additional discussion to this amendment? Okay, seeing none, a roll call has been requested, so the clerk will take the roll on the A6 amendment. Representative Freiberg. No. Representative Bierman. No. Representative Grunhagen. Yes. Representative Akam. No. Representative Egbaje. No. Representative Ackland. Yes. Representative Carlson. Carlson, no. Representative Franzen. 
Bramson? Yes. Representative Heinzman? Yes. Representative Morrison? Representative Pryor? No. With four ayes and six nays, the motion does not prevail. Okay, the amendment is not adopted. Uh, Representative Ackland, you have finally the A4 amendment. Would you like to move that? Yes, please. Okay, uh, please. The A4 amendment has been moved. Please uh, describe your amendment, Representative Ackland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll briefly describe my amendment. It, um, it adds to the parental review section to require school districts and charter schools to inform parents and guardians of the parental review requirements, which is in Minnesota statute. Number two, it, the amendment would require schools or charter schools to provide parents with a copy of the instructional materials used to provide the sexual, sexual health education. Number three, if a parent requests, the amendment requires that they must be allowed to be present during the sexual health instruction. And number four, the amendment allows a parent to opt the student out of the sexual health instruction with no academic or other penalty if they are not able to reach an agreement with a school district or charter school for alternative instruction. So I'd just like to make a few comments about it. Um, so in September of 2019, I felt called to run for office. And at the time, I had no awareness of the comprehensive sex education bill that had been discussed even previously. But within just a matter of weeks, maybe even days, this issue came up and the opposition to it has persisted since that time. Within the last two weeks, when people heard that this bill would have a hearing in our committee, I received a large number of emails. In fact, the number of emails on this topic has exceeded the number of emails I received on any other topic so far. So this proposal requires the school districts and charters to provide a program for comprehensive sex health education for elementary and secondary students. The program Sounds good, it must be age appropriate and developmentally appropriate and include instruction on consent, which is defined as affirmative, conscious and voluntary agreement to engage in interpersonal, physical or sexual activity. After seeing the literature that has been developed to accomplish these goals, parents have serious, legitimate concerns about the inappropriateness of the materials that may be recommended for use in this comprehensive sex ed class. For many parents, these materials are considered age inappropriate and often they are considered obscene, pornographic and not culturally sensitive. So you may agree or you may disagree with the views of the many citizens, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, guardians, who see the dangers in this type of le legislation, see the dangers that it exposes their children to. But whether you agree or not, you cannot disagree with the premise that all parents have the right to determine what is best for their own child. It is a parent's responsibility to know what their child is being taught, who is teaching it, and when the teaching is occurring. It is the parent's privilege to make these decisions. It is the school's duty to provide the who, what, when, and where of the sexual education. So a vote for this amendment is a vote to, to promote the family, to promote the rights of parents over the school. And um, I would ask for a roll call vote. Roll call vote, thank you. Roll call has been requested, so there will be a roll call on the A4 amendment. Uh, Representative Jordan, any response? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Ackland, for bringing this amendment forward. I think it's an important discussion, and it's important to go back to what the bill actually says. The bill doesn't provide a curriculum. It directs MDE to develop a curriculum. There is no book or diagram prescribed in this bill. It, the bill also says 
that districts have the opportunity to choose which community validators can use, can be, instruct, can be um, asked to instruct in this course. This bill also enforces that students should go to their important adults in their lives, including their parents and other community members. Um, as far as your amendment um, goes, I think it's important that one, we look at what's already in state statute regarding parental curriculum review. It says that each school district should have a procedure for a parent, guardian, or adult student 18 years of age or older to review the content of instructional materials to be provided to a minor child or to an adult student. And if the parent, guardian, or adult student objects to the content, to make reasonable arrangements with school personnel for alternative instruction. Alternative instruction may be provided by the parent, guardian, or adult student. Um, if the alternative instruction, if any offered by the school board, does not meet the concerns of parent, guardian, or adult student. The school board is not required to pay for the costs of alternative instruction. School personnel may not impose an academic or other penalty upon a student merely for arranging alternative instruction under this section and school personnel may evaluate and assess the quality of the student's work. And so I was pretty intrigued by this amendment. So I also talked to the Minnesota Department of Education about their thoughts on this since it's their job to evaluate it. Um, and this is what I received in response for some of their thoughts. It says that they're, one of the big concerns though is that the, Amer the amendment allows parents to be present in the classroom for this content. And there's nothing currently in state statute that would prevent a parent from being present. Uh, most district policies would not allow it. So this request would be part of make reasonable arrangements with school personnel requirements of the statute. And the district would be just responsible for defining reasonableness. Reasonableness. I think for me personally, I, a question that comes up often at the legislature is local control. So I worry that your amendment would take away some of that local control that I know is so important to so many legislators. So I think it's also, in, one of the areas that I was intrigued by though is without penalty. So maybe this amendment needs a little bit more work um, and we can talk about this. It's going to an education committee next where people are used to looking at education bills and can better evaluate this. So at this time, I uh, would ask for no vote on the Ackland Amendment. Uh, thank you, Representative Jordan, uh, for that explanation. If members could refrain from showing visual aids while other members are speaking, it's somewhat disrespectful to them. Um, although only the members are able to see that, I believe, on House Information Services. Um, any response, Representative Ackland, or any additional member discussion to the A6 amendment? And just a few things. So she did mention, you know, I, I the possibility of taking this away from local control. I think that's a stretch because the this guideline would want them to adopt the state controls. There are there are areas that they can do their own local, but it's a lengthy process. And uh, I don't know if people would be do that, but whether it's a local local program, a local curriculum or a state curriculum or a state model, I might not even say curriculum, let's just say a state model. I think that it's important that parents have, parents know when the education will be taking place ahead of time so that they can review the materials and that the parents should be provided with those materials. And I don't think that was in the statute. Um, the, I just wanted it clear um, that the, um, let me see, I had another thought here. Let me see if I can think of it. Um, oh, as far as being present during the, uh, I, I think it's important that there is some oversight during the presentation of this material. Um, and so I would say that that would be a very important piece of this because depending on who's teaching it, they might want to put a, that they might not follow exactly what the written is, or they could use verbal nonverbal cues to, to express their uh, opinion about it. So I would uh, urge a yes vote on this. Thank you, Representative Ackland. Just so members are aware, we will be voting on this bill at 11.55 a.m. I'm hopeful we'll have time for member discussion on the bill as a whole. Um, I may need to impose some you know, one or two minute time limits on members during that portion um, if this amendment discussion continues. Uh, Representative Groomhagen, is this to the amendment or is this to uh, the bill as a whole? No, it's to the amendment. I would just strongly encourage, as a former school board member, I don't see this usurping local control. I see this as empowering parents to participate in the education of their children. The bill itself does usurp local control, but that's another story. But this amendment actually encourages parents to be, participate in the education of their children 
in a meaningful way. You know, Representative Ackland uh, was a registered nurse. She also spent a lot of time uh, in her local school districts and her husband's a doctor. So, I mean, she comes with a lot of expertise on this and uh, members, uh, let's empower parents to see what's actually being done with their children. And that's not a bad thing. I never found that in 16 years as a school board member being a bad thing to get parents to participate in the process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Please vote yes. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Additional discussion to the A6 amendment. <laughs> Okay, seeing none, a uh, roll call has been requested. The clerk will take the roll. It's the A4. I'll just oh, I'm, clarify I'm sorry. that. You're right. Uh, uh, just, just so we're clear, <laughs> the, uh, a roll call has been requested on the A4 amendment. Thank you for catching that, Representative Ackland. Uh, the clerk will take the roll on the A4 amendment. Representative Freiberg. No. Representative Bierman. No. Representative Grunhagen. Aye. Representative Aikum? No. Representative Agbaje? No. Representative Ackland? Yes. Representative Carlson? No. Representative Franzen? Franzen votes yes. Representative Heinzman? Yes. Representative Morrison? No. Representative Pryor? No. With four ayes and seven nays, the motion does not prevail. Okay, the amendment does not prevail. Um, that concludes the amendments that were submitted. Um, I, we can turn now to member discussion. Um, members, please raise your hands if you would like to discuss the bill. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the bill author talked at the beginning when uh, the bill was introduced um about the inclusiveness of the uh legislation being offered and um you know one of the challenges we have as legislators debating this bill uh representative jordan actually brought to the attention of the committee in her uh, defense uh, or her argument against actually probably a better way of describing it against one of the amendments when she mentioned that the curriculum isn't here for us to see and it's incredibly frustrating. Um, as I read the bill, it looks like uh, the language allows for a curriculum to be adopted by the Minnesota Department of Education. Why wouldn't we um, have a better representation of what is being described so that we could actually evaluate it as opposed to just taking someone's opinion for it? I don't know. Um, but the contrast, I think, is that, or the assumption would be that somehow current um, sex education in Minnesota is inadequate. And like I said at the beginning of my comment, that the information uh, being uh, created or that would be adopted would be inclusive. I was wondering if the bill author uh, could point to uh, some uh, uh, part of current curriculums that isn't inclusive. Um, you'd talked, uh, quite a bit about some research and some feedback that you got from the Department of Education, Representative Jordan. Um, I'm assuming you've done some research to um, have some kind of a contrast between what you're offering and what's currently offered. Could you provide the committee um, any concerns or specific um, issues that you found with current uh, programs uh, around sexual education? Representative Jordan, um, if you could keep your answer short, that would be great. I have three members on the list. I'm probably going to have to ask members to keep their quest comments or questions two minutes each uh, so we can vote in time. But Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think um, I will hope that people are listening to our students who talk about the, the things that are missing here. We're hearing that there are huge gaps in education. I would also direct you to the letters specifically around consent. Students are not sure about consent. They're also lacking information about STIs. Students are also saying that they need more information about healthy relationships. Students are also asking for more relationship um, or asking for more information about um, LGBTQ issues and gender identity as well. I thought it was interesting. So I have the privilege to serve on both the education finance and policy committee um, and the Association of Metropolitan School Districts did a student survey and they reported that students wanted this information as well. So we're hearing from students that they are lacking that specific information and that is being left out of state statute. 
I think it's also Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, one more point to also think go back to the um, testimony from Ms. Nelson from um, Awesome, who talked about how students who are receiving special education are also being left out of the discussion around um, our um, sexual health education programming and that they are being left behind and are experiencing higher rates of violence as a result. Thank you, Representative Jordan. Um, I have five members on the list, so I think I'm going to have to cut it there. Mr. Chair, just a short comment. Uh, let's follow up, Representative Heinzman. I just want to say Thank I have you, representatives uh, Pryor, Grunhagen, Franson, Bierman, and Morrison on the list. So, Representative Heinzman, brief, if you could wrap it up briefly. I will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I hope that people who are watching this hearing today will notice that the bill author does have does not have any uh, specifics as to what is wrong with current sexual education in our schools today, that we're going off of all kinds of uh, opinions, which is fine. We're entitled to our opinion. But in the legislature, we deal with facts. I will be voting against the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Heinzman. Uh, Representative Pryor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I I do want to go back to, you know, we are the Preventive Health Committee, and um, I know that we've heard just great, great testimony on the importance of this piece of legislation and has, as it will promote comprehensive sex education and the importance of that to preventive health. Um, and so I would like to go, and so many of our testifiers um, spoke to that um, issue specifically, especially the factual information about it, uh, not interpretations, but factual information um, from the best sources available. So I would like to go back to our University uh, of Minnesota uh, expert, um, Dr. Oliphant, and talk about again, um, what's being left out of the current sex education right now in our schools that is causing, um, that, that we can include now with um, this sexual, this comprehensive sexual education. And what are the links then um, that, that we find that we have such better health outcomes that we do prevent disease, we do prevent unattended pregnancies, we do prevent um, the um, early starting of, of, of sexual activity when we use comprehensive sex education. And can you again um, talk to us about factually how we know this is true? Well, uh, Representative Pryor, thank you for your Dr. question. Oliphant, very quickly, please. Yes, so I already mentioned in the in the testimony, so I refer you back to those testimony. And I would just say that um, information varies greatly among all school, school, school districts, as well as the training that teachers get in order to become health, health teachers. This p particular aspect of that could be left out of the health uh, curriculum in becoming a health teacher. Thank you, Dr. Oliphant. Representative Grunhagen. Uh, there you go. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I hit the wrong button. I know you're short of time, so I'm going to just make a very quick uh, statement. Uh, yeah, uh, to, the, to the representatives voting on this bill, this bill is supported by Planned Parenthood. And as I noted, they support the killing of unborn children, 40% of which are blacks. The Planned Parenthood is a racist organization. Therefore, a, support, a vote for this bill is a vote for racism and for damaging, for killing unborn children and exploiting women sexually. Please members, I'm appealing to your conscience, vote no on this bill for the protection of, chi of uh, children and women. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. I don't believe we should be making assertions about other organizations um, that aren't here to defend themselves. Uh, Representative Franson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am on um, the Planned Parenthood website where it does speak about having a uh, program uh, to incorporate uh, this bill. So Planned Parenthood is driving the force behind comprehensive sex education. And if they have, if they have curriculums already ready to go for all of the states they are working with, then there is no reason why we lawmakers shouldn't have access to those same curriculums. Um, I am also looking at their main page. Uh, this one um, is, uh, let's see here, books and other materials. So there's all kinds of books uh, listed that they use in their curriculums. 
including the book that you said that I could not use as a prop, it's perfectly normal. And so I was showing those photos in the page and to, I guess it's not shown to the committee, but um, that's besides the point, or I mean, besides outside the committee, except just to you guys. However, um, if it's not good enough for the committee members to be looking at images like this, then what is it to say, why is it, if it's not okay for the committee members to see these very graphic images, which this book, Perfectly Normal, is geared for ages 10 and up. If it's not good enough to be used as a prop here in the committee, then why is it okay for this book to be shown to our kids in the classroom? I think it's kind of ridiculous. If I can't show these photos over the Zoom, how can, how can it be okay for our children to be exposed to these photographs in the classroom without our parents even knowing? Thank you, Representative Franson. My only point was that it was disrespectful to members to hold any, to make any sort of demonstration or hold any visual aid of it. It was not a, it was not a comment on the content of that. I just think it's disrespectful to the students in the classroom too. Towards members that are speaking. Uh, Representative Bierman. Mr. Thank Chair. You, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Chair. Mr. Chair, may I respond to that, please? Very quickly, Representative Jordan. Yes, Mr. Chair and Representative Franzen, the group that will be creating the program is the Minnesota Department of Education. That's what's in the bill, and that's what it's important to remember. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Jordan. Representative Bierman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you for the, the comments there. Representative Jordan, I was going to go to that myself. We have a lot of discussion about this bill in our communities, and we all do. I know that but I find that it is most advantageous to bring people back to the bill and what it actually says. And Planned Parenthood, while a community might decide, if you read lines 3.6 to 3.9, that they can include community educators, nowhere in the bill is Planned Parenthood or a book in particular listed. So it is still community involvement, and that's important to note for our constituents. I want to just thank Representative Jordan for bringing this important legislation back this year. This is a, an area where we, Minnesota, should be joining the dozen states in the United States that have factual, comprehensive sexual education. The data is clear that the, the situation with our students' education in this area needs improvement, and I want to thank Representative Jordan for bringing the bill forward and uh, continuing this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bierman. Representative Morrison, you get the final word for member comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Jordan, for bringing this bill forward. I, I wish this wasn't, wasn't as heightened as it seems to be. The these are just basic facts about our bodies and how we exist in the world, and we need to empower our children to know about themselves. So I just want to, I think it's so important that we make evidence-based policy in the legislature. And this is evidence-based policy. We know from multiple studies that comprehensive sexual education improves children's academic success. It prevents sexual abuse and dating violence and bullying. It helps young people to develop healthier relationships. It delays sexual initiation, and it reduces sexual health disparities among LGBTQ youth. Thank you, Representative Jordan, uh, for bringing this bill forward, and I urge a yes vote. Thank you, Representative Jordan. You can have a very quick wrap-up statement, and then we need to vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am hopeful that committee members will really listen to the students that testify today. Our students shared incredibly personal and empowering stories about how they are lacking the tools to make sound, healthy decisions about their bodies and their choices and their lives. They need this programming and they need this bill to be healthy, responsible adults. I thank you for your time today and I hope you'll support the bill. Thank you, Representative Jordan. With that, I will renew my motion to re-refer House File 358 as amended to the Health, Finance and Policy Committee. Would members please unmute themselves and the clerk will take the roll. Freiburg. Yes. Bierman. Yes. Grunhagen. No. Akam. Yes. Akbaje. Yes. Ackland. No. Carlson. Yes. Franzen. Nope. Heinzman. No. 
Morrison. Yes. Pryor. Yes. Seven eyes and four nays, Chair. With that, uh, the bill is re-referred. We are out. Of, we actually made it in one minute under the twelve o'clock mandatory adjournment time for House Information Services. Thank you for this discussion. Thank you for bringing the bill forward, Representative Jordan. Um, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.